Nina Marais is a textile and visual artist who has always been fascinated by organic elements in the natural environment. Originally from Cape Town, South Africa, the Cape Coast and the natural environment has continued to influence her work through the exploration of water and contrast as a theme. Her pieces consider the entanglement matters of materiality, ecology, and social structures, while incorporating the memory of places and things. Cloth can be twisted and contorted. It can be stretched and folded. In Tina's hands, it can hide, transform, and heal things. Now based in Canada, Tina has been influenced by seeing how climate change and human impact has started to transform this environment. She says, I always end up imagining mutations in natural organisms because of pollutants, and this is often what I try to visualize in my work. Tina looks at the natural environment through her own lens, seeing the ever-changing realities that are only visible to us at the time we experience it. This quality of change, the movement between decay and growth, inspire her abstractions. Using textiles as the basis for construction in her work, Tina contrasts natural and synthetic fibers to create shapes that echo organic and inorganic life forms, while creating elements of tactile memories. With strong pattern making and drafting skills, Tina has the freedom to create dimensional forms and is able to construct powerful installations that invite the viewer to be a participant in her world. A relentless collector or gatherer of diverse material objects, each object or sample of fabric speaks to her of its textural qualities and historical connections. Material reclamation, surface manipulation, and assemblage all come together to display expressive possibilities and her masterful handling of materials. Her work has been exhibited regionally, nationally, and internationally in both solo and group exhibitions. She has been selected for numerous international textile art biennales, most notably the 16th International Triennial of Tapestry in Poland. Her works are included in various public and private collections in Canada and internationally. Tina says, I often challenge the notion of textile as being soft, sometimes manipulating it to appear as metal sculptural forms. Please help in welcoming our 90th Friday feature artist all the way from Montreal, Tina Marais by leaving a comment and letting us know where you are in the world. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Hello! Hi, all you beautiful souls out there, and hello, Tina. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Mm, it is such a delight, such a delight. I am so excited to get to interview and ask you all the questions. Um, we have all kinds of people dropping in, dropping in. Hopefully they're not just dropping in. Hopefully they're here to stay. Uh, we have the lovely Lorna Crane. We have some. Well, we have someone from Ottawa and Vancouver, close to where I'm at. Lancashire, I believe that means you're up late. <laughs> and we have Bev uh, from Sacramento, Pittsburgh. Whoops, there we go. See, I'm still new at these, these little buttons, you guys. So you got to hang in there with me. Um, yeah, boy, we have all kinds of people. This is fabulous. Thank you all for joining us. It's a real privilege. Um, I have a million questions to ask Tina, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, now, as we're doing this, if you have questions that you want to ask her, make sure that you put them in the comments and we'll pop them up and, and she'll have some brilliant answers for you. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, Tina, you have an amazing career as a textile artist, just an amazing career with so many accolades and awards. Um, it's really, it's 
awe-inspiring. And I would love if you would just start by telling us a little bit about what was your creative path to this place? How'd you get here? Oh, it's, it's, um, thank you. I'm, I'm so touched. I often find myself feeling like I'm at the real beginning. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, after each project, you sort of start over again, but you build on what you did before. Um, I studied fine arts initially, and I specialized in drawing and painting, actually, oil painting. And on the side, I've worked with textiles since I was very, very little. I think I started knitting when I was about four. Um, and it's always been textile and that tactile interactions always been part of my life, but I didn't necessarily consider it uh, material for visual art expression. Mm -hmm. And um, in parallel, I did patent drafting, which uh, patent drafting for um, initially evening wear, etc., and then costume design later on. And I actually used that to help fund my art practice initially. <laughs> and it's kind of strange, like over over time, at some point about 10, 11 years ago, I started including textile in some of my mixed media work. And all of a sudden, the, the world of contemporary textile art practice opened up to me. And everything just made sense. And it gave me an enormous amount of freedom to choose this material as a form of artistic expression. That's amazing. Um, such a journey um, from the, the traditions of painting and drawing to, um, I love the fact that you learned how to do pattern making and that that helped um, take you through school. Um, and I can see um, the, how that pattern making has actually um, influenced your work that you are now. <laughs> actually, we'll just start with this because I'm gonna just go. Mm -hmm. One of the first times um, I've been, everybody, I've been following Tina for quite some time. I've been following and admiring her. I'm a bit of a fangirl. <laughs> so one of my first little messages that I sent her was, asking her about how she makes these incredible forms. And she messages me back about, well, I just make patterns. And my brain goes, because what I make is little balls of goo. So if anybody knows my work. But <laughs> I would love it, Tina, if you would tell us a little bit more about how that process of dressmaking and pattern making, how that's like evolved and is part of your work now. You know, also, I want in, a few comments. Yeah, in, in all honesty, um, I have a rebellious nature. <laughs> and when there's too much constrictions and precision, I have a revolt against it. So even though I did the pattern drafting, I automatically ended up devising my own method. Um, mm -hmm which was like an adaptation of what's known and what I knew worked. I think it's a feeling and an interaction with the material and really handling the material before you start working. So seeing what does the bias do? How does, how much does this piece of material extend? What, how does its fibers manipulate in my hands? And it becomes a conversation between the material and me. Usually what I do for my work is I do rough drawings. Sometimes it could be fairly detailed, but mm -hmm. usually trying to understand how the form I'm seeking is going to interact with space. And from there at this, well, it's been quite a few years that I do this. I literally just with a piece of soap, sketch it out directly on the fabric without even measuring. And I, I cut and I sew it together and then I make adaptations as I go. Sometimes I do little paper patterns um, if I'm going to do multiples of the same thing, but very often I cut one or two, and then if I have to cut a hundred, I just start using what I've already cut as a pattern and I just go for it. That's so, incredible. So, and then there's this, this thing where theater really helped me is understanding, especially when you look at traditional tailoring techniques, how mm -hmm. to mold fabric, how to make something have dimension yeah. um, and understanding how that form works. 
And then I guess it's just a lot of practice and trial and error. Yeah. Well, you can really see the way those um, techniques create those three dimension and those like amazing forms that you have, excuse me, going on. It's, um, it's uh, quite a skill to admire. Uh, so when I look at your, you know, your installations and I'm going to pull a piece up here because your installations are this whole environment of things, you know, and I stare and I can see the, the, the vision, the image. What I am curious about, um, you started telling us a little bit about it, but uh, would you tell us a little bit about how, what the process is? How do you go from that materiality, that touching of the process, touching the product, working with it to this, you know, enormous installation that's all encompassing? Um, I'm, I'm it's, overwhelmed. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's actually sometimes a reverse. I work in different ways. So sometimes it's a it's a visual, it's it's a concept, it's a visual, it's an image, it's something that I would just start drawing or I can imagine it and I can see it dimensionally and I just start sketching it and then plan it out from there, like how am I going to re arrive at the final result that I'm aiming at? And sometimes it could literally be an object, a piece of material, a seed, a stone, um, a memory of something that that sparks um, a form. It's it's sometimes a very natural, organic process. I just feel like I need to make this form because it says something to me. And very often there's an emotional or research undercurrent in the work so it sort of has two layers or two folds of meaning wow that's amazing do you end up doing any do you do maquettes or mock-ups at all or is it all just a process it depends sometimes because i do do public artworks as well so right. for that you have to build maquettes um Usually I can see what I want to do so clearly in my imagination that I do drawings and obviously I measure out things or I might make paper, like even the installation you showed with the wooden piece. Mm -hmm. I made paper patterns first so that I could see how they would work in the space Yeah, and then had them cut in wood. Yeah. So I, I had to calculate it out visually instead of just drafting it on measure. Yeah, that makes Does sense. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's Something a huge. I have to so to able to see it. I could use cardboard. I could use paper, but right. I, I literally make the pattern of it and take it to the space and see how does this work? Is this the curve I want? And then make adjustments and then take it from there. Oh, that's fabulous. I can see you with the pieces of cardboard in the gallery, hanging things around. Um, yeah, totally. It makes sense. So you mentioned doing um, public artwork. And I know in reading about your stuff, you've done actually a lot of public artworks and a lot of social outreach and community work. Um, so you've worked with hundreds of people from different diverse backgrounds and such. And I would love to hear a little bit more about that. I'd love to hear, um, you know, what are, what are the joys in that? What are the challenges? Because um, I don't know, working with artists is sometimes like herding cats so <laughs> yeah th this is well um it's it actually when i arrived in quebec i needed to learn french because that's um the official language in quebec and i because i'm working in culture this was really important to me and i got very lucky i lived just off the island of montreal so it's sort of Greater Montreal and in a, a town called uh, Vaudreuil d'Orion. And our cultural director of the city was very, very active in um, trying to build projects with local artists to integrate this large amount of immigrant community that we had. In 2011, when I arrived here, I think about 20 or 30% were first, second generation immigrants. 
And then by now, I think it's almost 60% of the local population. So there's a huge need to create um, a sense of identity and a sense of uh, interaction within the community, especially since it's so culturally diverse and people tend to stick to others of their same culture. Yeah. And this opened the door to multiple projects. And because I was doing costume design at the stage, they found me and they invited me to be on the artistic direction with four other artists, which we did for almost 10 years in this big community parade. And that led to a lot of other projects. Um, it's extremely rewarding to work with the community. I think there's it's a space as an artist where you remove yourself from the work, even if it's your project, and it becomes the work of the participants. It becomes the work of the community. And you sort of have to remove yourself from that and it becomes their work, but you become their hands, their guide, and, mm. and like an instigator for conversation, basically. Because the more we speak to others, the more it removes barriers. And I think this is really, really important because we don't exist in isolation yeah yeah i love that that you're their guide and that they become part of your hands that um amazing connection because you're right we don't we very much don't exist in isolation even though it has felt like it the last few years it, it has and i think that's um especially as well with the internet and social media and everything we're so hands off and we're touching smooth screens the whole time so i think that physical interaction with material and closeness to other people and it, it's so fundamental to who we are as a species too so yeah 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 well that's an amazing segue into what i'd like to talk to you about and ask you about and um that's the idea of materiality. Uh, it's That certainly is not a new concept or a new idea, but it is a word that is getting used in the art world a lot more. Um, and I use it in the descriptions of my work. And I would love to just hear you talk a little bit about materiality and that how that tactile, how that touching, how that getting away from the screen um, creates our artistic and um, community movement yes so um yeah i'm very interested and curious about uh, new materialist theory and the way that we um can give agency to non-human matter and materials so making humans not the main focus of social structure for example and looking at what is the materials or the matter that construct things that we're using, where does this come from? And what story does that bring into it? And then I, I also get very interested on things, um, not as a scientist, but as an artist, in the imagination of what is its molecular, connection to other things because all matter vibrates so how is the things that we surround ourselves with or we gather vibrating around us and how is those vibrations interacting on our own vibrations and reactions to this material um for example when it comes to matter i'm really curious about this transition for example if you take a piece of um i might be going off subject here but yes bear yeah. with me of a pair of jeans mm -hmm. and where is the cotton being produced what is the impact of that cotton production on the water use of that landscape and the people and the earth where it is being grown, where it might not naturally have been growing. And now that earth is forced to produce X amount of cotton, which puts the load on that ecosystem. Then that raw material produce is transported across ocean, which impacts the oceanic environment. Somewhere else where it gets turned into thread and spun and turned into cloth. 
and then transport it somewhere else where it's getting dyed and then transport it somewhere else where it's getting sewn um and what are those circumstances and what's that impact on that environment so the molecules of that original material mm-hmm. is transitioning through many many hands and interacting as a element so much before it gets becomes something that's in interaction with our body that we wear and that becomes something functional but also something comforting to to our skin or or as a um, an armor that we clothe ourselves in so there's there's that whole aspect of it and then it's also this really philosophical perspective that um we are part of an ecosystem we are also just molecules that are not better or worse than any yes. other molecule that we find on the planet but we hold all the power mm-hmm. and we are destroying everything else because of the power that we hold in sort of this global ecosystem and what if we gave agency or um political presence to non-human elements Mm -hmm. that's there we go that's a deep conversation um i love it i love thinking about this um i i work with um reuse materials myself too and that is part of my process is where where has this been how has it interacted with humans how has it touched other people's life how was it produced you know that's i that connection really i feel like is um, at that essence of materiality yeah and doesn't it feel like a piece of cloth always carries the story of where it came from or or um um, I've been working with old linen bed sheets, and, mm. and a bed sheet for me is is so entangled in intimacy, but also personal stories. It's, and I think it's it sort of becomes ingrained in the material. And if we don't know what the story was, it comes with this power of its memory. Yeah. The the bed sheet thing is just incredibly fascinating to me um it was remind me what um ex- exhibition oh i know it was at your um, it was at your artist residency is that right that yes i i actually i started working with linen for uh unfold my skin which was my thesis exhibition and then i did a residency with contextile in portugal last mm-hmm. summer and I had the privilege of working with the most incredible Portuguese linen there. But what was really interesting for me is we worked in an old hospital. And one of the guardians of the hospital told us the story of how precious the linen cloth was and how they would, once the bed shoots were completely worn out, it would be made into pillowcases and then smaller pillowcases for children and then eventually into bandages. And there's, this thing of this story in the material and how it becomes and evolves and gets smaller and smaller and smaller that I thought was just so poetic. And then also this idea of the, of um, healing and how linen is a natural antibiotic. So that's why it was used for bandages, for example. And it's a cloth also that uses a lot less water to produce. So there's that sort of, ecological side to it and then of course the egyptians wrap the mummies in linen cloth which are, which are wow. still um yeah. still uh, happening so that's amazing i would love to pull up a few um images from that exhibit i think there so people can kind of get a feel of what you were working with and how it relates to that this concept of linen and bed sheets And then it's the the idea of the wrapping and unwrapping of the body, which also reflects on the way we clothe ourselves. And we we are in reality wrapped in cloth from the minute we're born until the minute we die. It's part of our fragility. Yeah. 
yeah, I'm super fascinated by that and and the use of sheets. Um, I have been working mostly with cotton sheets, but that idea that like every day we interact with it. Almost every human interacts with these sheets. We wake up in them, we go to sleep in them. Or if we don't have sheets, that is an influence on our, our lives. Um, so I, I love this concept that you're talking about with the linen and how it's broken down and used and used and used. Um, and then that those essences come into the work that we are doing that connects into that materiality um, and moves forward into a, a new creation. Mm -hmm. so, um, I am been fascinated since I first seen it and it's actually on the wall behind you. It, um, it's, I believe it's called undercurrents. Um, talk about yes, well, this is actually not, this is a smaller piece of the okay. same series. Can um, I pull up an image? Uh, can I pull up a couple of images on it and you just tell us about it? Yeah, this the the this piece is currently in uh, the first material biennale in Beijing in China, um, which is an incredible exhibition. There's a lot of uh, videos and material about it online, um, which is definitely worth looking at if anyone's interested in materiality and the way this is influencing contemporary art. Um, these pieces were the, the larger piece under current, which was the first one with the drifting of pistachio shells. So they made of tea bags and pistachio shells. So tea bags is a single use item. I'm originally from South Africa and this work sort of echoes that map of South Africa, the southern tip mm. of Africa. Not exactly. It's somewhere between an animal skin and this map. And then it has the drifting of sort of this, the water, the shoreline, but also debris that's being washed up. But it's all empty pistachio shells, which is a natural product, but it's empty. Once the pistachio is out, the shell becomes empty. So there's something for me in this single use items, mass production, reusing, but also the transit of material because the Cape was a huge point of transit before the Suez Canal between the East and the West. And it's, it's this idea of shifting materials ac across the globe and the passage of time and, and the havoc that wreaks, but it's also something that is so necessary. So there's a lot of uh, contrast in there. That's amazing. Um, the shape, um, thanks for sharing the, the, the shape um, being influenced by the map of South Africa. Also that feeling of animal skin, they very much, um, you know, look from afar, there is no, um, I wasn't able to identify that they were pistachio shells, which is part of that, uh, is amazing part of that intrigue um, that happens with the, your work. You know, it has a, a form from a distance and has one story. And then as we are pulling in deeper, we get to see the details and the other stories that are coming out and um, the richness of getting to hear you tell us even more. It's amazing. Yeah. And then on a technical sense, I did not eat all the pistachios. I uh, ate all the pistachios in this piece, <laughs> but yes. the others were very kindly collected for me by by a lot of um, friends and and people from elsewhere that even sent them to me in the mail, which was amazing. Oh. And then um, it took quite a lot of trips to the hardware store to figure out how to drill holes in them. Oh, because yes. I didn't in all of them, but in some parts, I used them as beads. But to make sure that they're well anchored, I needed to make a hole in them. Uh -huh. Which, once you know how, is fairly simple. But <laughs> Well, and I have questions that just popped up right there asking about them. So besides How drilling... am I attaching them? So I embroidered them in sections, but... Uh, for the rest, I actually put them individually in ones or in twos inside tea bags. Yeah, there's an, let's see, another question. Um, what fabrics are on this? I love the transparency. So, 
transparent. So the tea bags are nylon tea bags, actually. So they're semi-transparent, but it's on a mm -hmm. cotton backing. And then there are parts that's um, like an organza, but a little bit thicker so that there's transparency. And that's where I did the embroidery. That's amazing. Let's see. I was, um, Lax, I was so busy listening to you that I forgot to check on all of our questions. And we have a bunch of amazing comments. So I'm going to just pull a few of these up and make sure. Let's see. Oh, this is going back to um, the materiality and um, the vibrations. So when you talk about vibrations, do you mean physically or metaphysically or both? I get the bit about molecular structure and our role in the ecosystem. But could you please explain further? That's a big question. That's a big, that's a big yeah. question. So um, molecules vibrate. There's energy in them. So in fact, everything around us, or this is the way I envision this, has a constant little bit of a vibration to it. Even the sound of our voice, if you think of sound waves of a voice, is a vibration too. So when I look at things around me, it's almost like I constantly feel that everything is moving a little bit and that everything can move into everything else that it comes in contact with. So I'm, I hope that sort of answers your question without getting too technical. Yeah, yeah. It's a complex um, idea. Very like complex. And then it's also almost on a philosophical level that nothing exists by itself. Right. Back to everything that interaction. Because of everything else that surrounds. Yeah, yeah. So in these um, connecting all of these pieces together and looking at your body of work, you really are working with a lot of different materials. You know, we think of you as a fiber artist, but you are bringing in um, ceramics and wood and other things. Can you tell us a little bit more about that um, combination of materials? How does the, the hard and the soft and the different textures work together for you? In a way, I think it's really fundamental. To some extent, over the last few years, I've become far more purposeful in my choices of combining materials. I think initially when I started, um, it, it was literally just a call of the material and seeing what it would do and how it would interact with other materials, visually or texturally. Um, I really love the idea of making textile appear hard because it is something that's soft. And I think for me, for example, I used to do a lot of, I still do, a lot of sort of these horn shapes or pointed shapes in my work. And I think that comes from my memories from South Africa, from the coastline, where a lot of the plants and the, the animal life, if you think of cactuses or thorn trees, have these horns and thorns to sort of make them look dangerous or seem overbearing or seem um, powerful. But in fact, it's because they're so fragile that they've got these horns to kind of hide their fragility. And I, this for me becomes a big metaphor. It's like we're, we put on our pointy toed shoes to, to feel strong and present, to, to put an armor on our vulnerability. So these are, are sh shapes that repeat and come back into my work. So it's, then it becomes this contrast that it looks hard, but it's actually soft. It, yes. it cannot harm you. Then I've been bringing in, yes, I've been bringing in some ceramic, which is new, that I started doing last year. I'm very much in an exploratory phase with it, but I love the combination of the, and the fragility of the ceramic, which is mm. hard, with a textile which is soft and far stronger and more durable. So I... I think it's this contrast that's in everything. It's in our human nature. It's in our relationships. This push and pull be between tenderness and strength. 
Yeah. And then um, wood, I have a thing for, my dad used to mm -hmm. make beautiful wooden things and just the smell of sawdust and that connection with, um, sometimes one just needs to hug a tree. And I think <laughs> touching wood just gives you that, that yeah. connection with nature, with something that's that stood still and being constant much longer than we have yeah yeah i too have worked with i started actually with ceramics and have worked with cloth and one of the things that i love about them is you're you're talking about the fragility and those versus strength i also really love how both ceramics and cloth have this capacity to mimic other things Mm -hmm. um, you know, to create the look of wood, to create the look of fabric, to create the look of horn. Yeah, mm -hmm. super fascinating. Mm -hmm. One of the things I have noticed in your work, and it's almost like illustrated in our backgrounds, um, you have those pale tones, um, and I have these bright red tones, but you were kind of a, a master of using color in different ways to have different conversations. And I actually have a question that's about color. Um, Sally wants to know, do you add color or do you use material color as you get it? So I think that's a great segue into telling us about uh, how you use uh, um, how you use color, both practically and also emotionally. Yeah. So to respond to the question, a bit of both. I often choose fabric specifically for its color, but I do also do some dyeing. Um, it really depends on what I'm working on. I prefer not to do too much dyeing because of the, the water impact of it, which I, I sometimes sit a little, yeah, I sit in contrast with it. Let me put it like that. Mm -hmm. um, color, yes, color is extremely important to me. I grew up in south africa as we've said and i now live in montreal in canada and i think one of the biggest things that i notice is the way the sun hits certain parts of the globe really changes the way we see color or see the environment so in south africa it's really well lit if i can put it like that its colors are far more vibrant and richer and it's it's part of the culture of the the environment where you're it's much softer it's like everything is is more down toned and um restful and i often don't want color to take away from the form of the work or from the essence of the work and yet color is something that that evokes so much raw emotion i when I was doing theater, for example, I would use, I would say, if you imagine an actress standing in the middle of a stage, lit with one light on her, no music, no speaking, just standing on the stage, and she's wearing a white dress, what you're imagining in mood is very, very different to if she was wearing a red dress. And I bring this theory back into my work. So I used to, many years ago, work far more colorful and now i'm really diligent in my choices so i have different bodies of work and i choose the color palette for each body of work which i feel emotionally connects this to the thematic of that series of works ah that's fabulous um, I just want to show uh, a couple of pieces that are have a lot of bright red. I believe these are from um, the series Breathless. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. I'm going to pull a few of yeah, these up. These are from the Breathless series. It's actually, um, I did a whole body of work in 2020, which is called Maladi, which is illness. And then I did a series of work which was breathless. So it's this idea of muta mutating cells and what does it mean to be gossiping for breath? And then also that idea is that air enters our bodies. So it's a direct interaction to our interior with the exterior world. Um, but really on this idea of mutating cells, et cetera, et cetera. 
So for those works, that idea that it has to create discomfort, I think the reds and and oranges and especially with the sculpture forms I'm using create that um, malaise, like an, an mm. uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the power of color to um, tell us so many different things. I I really love that image of the the actress or the actor sitting on a stage, not saying anything. But what what happens when they're in red? What happens when they're in white? Um, that's really a powerful in your work. Um, so you work in um, abstraction or I believe you would consider yourself an abstract artist. I'm always curious about this idea of abstraction. Um, I see a lot of symbolism in your work too. Mm -hmm. And where is that Where is that line for us between abstraction, symbolism, um, interpretation? That's something that I'm always fascinated by. That's a very good question because it's not really one or the other. I think it's it's in between. I think I use I choose the word abstraction because it's an abstraction of ideas. It's an abstraction of concepts. And I think it's easier because especially if you're working in contemporary textile art practices, it's not something that's it's becoming far more widely known in contemporary art fields, but by using words that's more easily accessible to the general public, it becomes easier to explain what it is that you are expecting to see. Right. But it is not necessarily abstract because, yes, as you say, it's far more poetic in, in a sense. Um, but as a way of visually explaining what you're looking at that relates to a broader audience in contemporary art practices, I think that's why I go towards that word. Yeah, yeah. It's a fascinating thing. And it's a, it's a fascinating thing how our human brains, even when we try not to look at something and start to identify it, try to identify it looks like this, it looks like that. And where does that take us? And how does that, how does that work as artists to communicate what the subtlety of what we want to communicate? Yeah, and I, I think what's always been really fundamentally important for me is that you have to feel the work. You have to feel the presence of the work and then you'll understand it. It's right. an emotional response to what you're visually encountering. Yes, the complexity of it. Yeah. So I'm going to pull up another comment here. Um, this is from a wonderful Debs. Uh, Tina, I am in awe of you and your work. I also had a career in the fashion industry in South Africa. That's amazing. I love that you are so prolific. Do you work on many pieces at the same time or a series at a time or? Everything at the same time. <laughs> ah, yes. The chaos of all of it. <laughs> I'm so glad that's what it that. feels like usually, but I do, I cannot just work on one piece at a time. I keep telling my one very good friend that's a mosaic artist here, Monica, which may be listening, mm -hmm. that I really should try and work on one thing at a time, but it doesn't work. It doesn't happen. I, I often reach a point with a piece of work where I need to put it aside and I need to look at it and I need to think on it about it. But my only way of thinking concretely about it is to have my hands busy so I automatically start working on something else and then because I do projects and commission works and exhibitions there's often an overlap I do however just in I or I have been more focused on that the last few years I focus on one body of work for an extended period of time so I would for example, spend six months or a year on one series of work or one body of work and explore it and expose the themes around that and the materials around that and then jump back to a different or start a new body of work. Yeah. So you, um, if, when you're working on a body of work, you actually will, I want to just make sure I understand this, you will return to that body of work later on. Did I hear that? 
Mm, sometimes. Some okay. of them, when it's finished, it's finished and mm -hmm. it's completed and I move on from it onto a new theme or a theme that extended from that theme. Oh. It's like an ongoing cycle. Um, I think at this point, the previous bodies of work are all completed and I will not be adding to them anymore. I'm really focusing now to extend this idea of folds and and with with the linen and organic objects like relics that become objects of memory that are not plant, not animal, not human, but that speak of um, fragmented memories of, of objects and things. And then really the, the philosophical content and ideas of folding that have this hidden and revealed infinity that just keeps going and it becomes this sort of multi-layered structure that the present does not exist without the past and the future, even if the future has not happened yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just so much on it, so. Yeah. The intertwined. I love it. Deb is um, saying pretty much the same thing I did. I love it. Thank you for the honesty. I am the same. I used to think it was an inability to concentrate on one thing at a time, but now I tell myself it's the multitasking gift. And I have to agree with both you and Deb, and I am relieved to hear that from you because I am constantly from here to here and letting this piece influence that piece and, um, and going back to themes and expanding on them yeah that everything is is not linear <laughs> yeah <laughs> no it's not linear at all yeah no. yeah so i want to ask you just like some fun questions you know we've been getting very serious um but i don't know what is if you what is the artist dead or alive that like makes you squeal with joy and of course, it's, it's I must, like, the first one, and he's still one of my favorites, is William Kentridge from South Africa. I oh, just, yeah. he has such a keen sense of sensibility and political activism mm -hmm. balance that, that I completely admire. Of course, there's Louis Bourgeois. I mean, yes, 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 yes. you know. Um, Oh, there's there's so so many i if i start naming the list will go on forever but i, hear you. Um, I think there's so many incredible creators that have have a very special gift to to leave something that makes us think and question yeah definitely it's um so so much inspiration and again that interconnectedness so i'm curious in your process um which is interconnected involved um complex what is your favorite part <laughs> uh, i i think it really depends on where i'm at in the process i love i love um The moment before the opening of an exhibition when everything hangs and it's at that point of it's not it it may not feel like it's completely resolved or completely finished but it's there and it's separate and it now has to live its own life mm. but very often when i'm at that point i'm of, i've already started another body of work so my head's already detached to some extent Mm -hmm. I love the initial research phase or that moment when you see an object or a plant or read a phrase and it just goes, oh, wait, come back. I need to investigate this. I need to try and understand this. I need to um, take it apart or just keep it as an object of mystery um so there's that that sort of and sometimes we don't understand why certain things really relate to us or create that response 
So that beginning phase or or moment of um, embryonic ideas is something mm -hmm. that I, I really enjoy. Um, there's moments, they, there's the procrastination that I think all artists have at mm -hmm. some point too, but I call it now, I've accepted it as, as proactive procrastination because it's sort of a point in time where you need to go and walk and think and mull over things and make drawings and scrap ideas and feel stuck with it sometimes until you reach that point where it really becomes clear what you're trying to articulate right that conflict yeah and then there's the fun starting with a new form and is it going to turn out like i want it to turn out and what surprise is the material going to add onto what's going to be the contribution the conversation the material has back into what is happening with the work in the end so there's yeah. that part too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah it's it's i think one learns at some point to enjoy each part of it for what it is there's course not one that's better than the other but it is a process and it's also an emotional process because i think like like any artist or creator or creative person when you're starting you're really excited about the process and then at some point you're like this makes no sense this um is not doing what i wanted to do so there's that point of struggle too and i think if we avoid that struggle part, we do not grow as artists. Yes, yeah, very much. And I love that word you used. Was it procrastinate? No, procreation. Proactive procrastination. Proactive procrastination. Yeah, I love it. And is there a chance you could put that up there for us? Because that is such a great word. So you've already asked my next question, which was like, what is the part that's the hardest or the worst part? But it sounds like every piece kind of has its own life. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's also, because in my work, there's a lot of repetition. So it takes a lot of time to work through a piece. Mm -hmm. And there are moments when it's physically pure torture. Right. Um, if you're stitching through very thick fabric or very big pieces for hours on end, it becomes a very labor intensive and very physical process. Mm -hmm. um, so. And I, I relate very personally to that labor torture, labor, self-torture, almost that you put yourself through. I think it's something that's very humbling and I think it's something that's very honest and I think it's something that shows in the work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that connects us to everyone else and to everything else. Right, that interconnection again. I have a question from Johanna. Is, improv is improvisation a big part of your process? <laughs> All the I, questions. About oh, that. Yeah. I, I would rather say my process can be very organic, but I don't think it's improv. No. Yeah. I, oh, that's, that's a really good more of a flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that that idea. What is organic and what is improv? You know, yeah. Again, getting into all of these words and these concepts and how how they're complex and interconnected. Yeah. So you had another great. Oh, going back to kind of what we were talking about with abstraction. Um, Rita says, "Now I understand why it annoys me when people say that they see a cat or a bird in my work." I also use abstraction and symbolism as a way to express my emotional response to my theme and materials. And I love it when the viewer gets that and also responds emotionally. Could it be that we sometimes prefer surface recognition rather than going deep? Well, that's a, that is quite a thought. And I have to, um, I have felt that in my own work too, as I have a piece that I, that I see in a way and it has all these things. And then somebody is like, it looks like a chunk of meat. And what do we do as artists, you know? And what is? Um, I, I think, I think people, mm, 
I think there's there's always that tendency to want to take the easiest road, right. and the easiest road is to not be open to um, other interpretations that come very quickly or that that come without digging a little bit deeper. I mm -hmm. think as artists, if someone's saying that to you with your own work, is to then start questioning the person. And why do you think that is a piece of meat? Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about meat? Right. You, you know, like, like sort of, instead of straight away saying, no, this is not at all what this work is speaking about, trying yeah. to understand and trying to make the spectator then question their own response to the work, which I think gets far more interesting. Yeah, it is. I actually, after the initial like shock, I wasn't going there. It was interesting to take that question and that observation and to look deeper into the work and perhaps see layers that I subconsciously hadn't um, hadn't planned, but that were there. Um, so I think this is, again, another really interesting thing. And there's yes, also that. Yeah. Go ahead. Don't you think that it's also always that people interpret or respond to work from their own experience and their own background. So not. not necessarily the work has its own life at the end of the day. It becomes very separate from us and each person based on their um, his personal history, experiences, interests, it will respond differently to it. It's right. really good to have the intention of the artist explained. I think it's very important. But mm -hmm. I think the sort of natural response to to art, to, to work, especially text on fiber-based work that's in a strange way so relatable because it's tactile. And right. even if it's a visual tactile response, it's a material that's familiar. Cloth, I think, is more familiar to us than paint and paintbrush. Right so personal and intimate so personal yeah, so a memory is attached so i think it becomes very interesting to 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 um take that initial response and turn it back in questions yeah oh that's great that's fabulous i wish i would have remembered that as <laughs> i was having that conversation yeah, but sometimes we're just completely flawed and and yeah. you know when you get to the point of a big exhibition you're usually exhausted too so yes. You're... yes yeah yeah i was interested when you were speaking of how your favorite part of you know the one seeing it all um exhibited and in its finished place, but you're also at the same time starting something new. And again, that, that circular nature, that, that life and death, that contrast. So yeah. I'm going to grab another question. Oh, oh, let's see. Not sure what, how do you work through the engineering of the work? Uh, let's see. Actually, I think that that was, there we go. How do you work through the engineering of the work to maintain the structure? Ah, that's that's a good question. It I really choose very carefully what I'm using as a backing or a base for the work mm -hmm. and how I mold that. And then I usually, um, depending on what it is, if it's a big mural work, I build structure in the top. If it's not, because I don't specifically for my work like if it ends um straight at the top so i often have curved edges but evidently it needs to be supported otherwise it would collapse so i use a variety of stiffeners um of pattern construction of what my my base or my foundation fabric is has to really be able to support the weight of the work and the form of the work um so it's a combination of things. And I think it's really at the end, just a combination of experience. When I do public artworks and I do my kids, I actually work with actual engineers because it goes in public spaces and it needs to be safe for the public. And I, you, you need to have that extra security or um, I hope that answers. 
Yes, makes sense to me. I mean, there's really um, what so you when they for smaller work, it's it's engineering a smaller piece. It's it goes back to that idea of drafting the pattern. What is the form I want to achieve, and how do I break it down into two dimensional pieces of cloth that I then can add together to get to the three dimensional shape that I want. Right. Yeah, and it's amazing that. Um, and I'm sure maybe intimidating. It would be intimidating for me. I will not project, but working with engineers, when you get to the place of how, you know, it's one thing is how does this hang on a wall in Drape Right? And how does this hang um, in a street and not, you know, and work with the balance and such? Yeah, that's amazing. I'm going to again look at a couple. We are, we're almost up at our hour. I'm going to make sure that we have. Um, got all these questions. Let's see. Glenda, can I ask how you start a project? Is it gathering inspiration? Is it notebooks? Lots of writing? And I think we've talked some about that. Is there anything else that you would want to add to that? How do I start a project? Um, it's, it's a combination of all those things, actually. More reading than writing, necessarily, initially. Yeah. And very often it starts with a, a few within a week or a month period different ideas or different things that's really standing out to me it's almost like i find patterns in my environment so if i travel to a new city that i don't know there may be some pattern in the architecture in the plants that becomes very repetitive and and then anchors onto research and then anchors onto an emotional content or it could be an emotional experience and then finding them it, so it goes in all directions really there's no um concrete structure but yes it starts with a concept it starts with drawings usually or it starts with an emotional content or a activist feeling if it's more in my mentalist for example so it starts with an idea. Yeah, yeah. Like so many other things we're talking about, it's multidimensional. It comes from so many different directions. You know, the activist feeling, the patterns. You know, we are, we're sponges. We absorb all these things and let them come through us and out into the world. Um, let's see. Um, not. May I ask what kind of stiffeners you're using? This is a great, thank you for asking this. Uh, I'm curious too. Um, so my favorite of all the stiffeners is called Stitch Witchery, which I don't think is its oh. official name at all. Um, it's it's a fusible that's um, web-like that you can put between two layers of fabric and then you iron and it basically acts as a glue that holds it together. So oh. I really love this. And then instead of standard iron on stiffeners, for example, I would use a thick cotton tool fabric and I will use it in between two other layers of fabric to build that density. Okay, so, so that you're using a, an adhesive that actually is going to hold, a heat adhesive that's gonna hold two pieces of fabric together to create the- Yeah, for certain things. For other things, I would like the, the support layer or the stiff layer to literally float between two other layers. Ah, it okay. It the lining in a coat that's attached right. with vortex. So there's a little um, movement or air passage that can pass between the two layers. Mm -hmm. So that's also something I would do. Uh, it depends on the effect that you want, which material you use. Absolutely. Yes, in terms of iron-on fusibles, the one that I prefer the most is one that's slightly stretchy because mm. I think it gives me more moldable capacity. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for answering. I'm, I'm super intrigued. Well, we are just, we are at our hour. We're a little bit over, um, but I would love to give you um, the opportunity to um, just share with our people that are here, these amazing artists. And um, do you have anything to say um, in regards to working as a fiber sculptor? Some of our, some of our people are painters and um, 2D. What is it 
if somebody wanted to go from doing two-dimensional work and move out into sculpture, what kind of advice do you have for them? Just do it. Um, <laughs> do it. <laughs> I am. Um, just it, do it. I love it. That's great. That's all you need. We need to say. No. <laughs> uh, basically, I think it boils down to you. We we feel so much pressure that we immediately need to succeed with something, but everything is part of a learning process. And if you don't try and make mistakes, you won't learn. And I think it's a very natural and very personal process. So start with observing and start with trying and no one have to, has to see what you try but also observe how elements in nature or in architecture or in space are interacting with positive and negative what are the angles from which we're seeing something at and try and deconstruct what that looks like if you look at a glove for example look at how the glove is assembled to try and see how, why does it have depth? Which parts were added to it to give it its dimensionality? And then when you get to sculpting objects, you use that same way of deconstructing the shape from two to three dimensions back and forth the whole time. Yeah. But it's practice. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. I love it. Um, I almost forgot you. Um, we have a lot of people that are in Australia and you have an exhibition coming up in Australia and um, a workshop. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? I will be very brief because, uh, yes, it's super exciting. I have a, an exhibition at Gallery um, 67 in Sydney in November, mid-November. Um, we have their website that we could maybe pop in the chat, but they will put um, information up a little bit later in the year. It'll be in November, and I will be hosting a workshop, but the details are not available yet because I'm still um, deciding. So if anyone has any ideas, let me know uh, exactly how to mold the workshop and whether I do a one or two day workshop. So. That is fabulous. Thank you so much, Tina, for joining us. And thank you for the amazing conversations. Um, as we play our exit video, um, everyone feel free to share some gratitude and um, just some love for, for Tina and this experience. Thank you so much for giving us this time. Thank you so much for inviting me and hosting me. And thank you, Clarissa. It was such an, an honor and a privilege to work with you and to chat with you before as well. Um, so many connecting themes and for everyone that took the time to listen and join us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.